just giving a few moments for all of the participants who have registered for today's event to join us. So we're allowing that to happen before we get kick started off with uh, the 10th anniversary. Thank you for your patience. So good afternoon and good evening to those who may be joining us from various other parts of the world and good morning to others who may be on the other side of the country right now. I wanna welcome everyone to a celebration of the 10th anniversary of the Dallaire Institute for Children, Peace and Security. We were formerly known as the Romeo Dallaire Child Soldiers Initiative and housed at Dalhousie University, we have offices both here in Halifax and Ottawa. We also have staff members in places like Toronto, Quebec, and staff located throughout Africa. My name is Dr. Shelley Whitman, and I am the Executive Director, as well as the Intact Senior Fellow at the Dallaire Institute for Children, Peace and Security. I'm so thrilled to be hosting this very special event and a milestone with all of you present today to remember the past 10 years and help chart the course for the future of this institute. Before we begin today's session, it's important we acknowledge that the Dallaire Institute and Dalhousie University are located in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. We acknowledge the virtual nature of our event and the realities of a world in a pandemic means that we have participants with us who are located all over the world. And so we encourage you to reflect on where you are located and the relationships with the ancestral lands and its traditional peoples. Colonialism has caused a lot of damage that is still seen in our institutions and our societies today. And we encourage you to work with your neighbors and to dismantle those legacies to create more equitable societies for all who live in them. When we discuss peace and reconciliation here in Canada and around the globe, it is up to all of us to remember the important roles that we have to play. Firstly, we must learn about and actively listen to our Indigenous peoples when they raise their voices on the injustices that they have had to face and continue to face. And secondly, we must commit to make a change that goes beyond words or lip service towards tangible and concrete actions. Systemic racism is an issue that remains far too prevalent in all of our societies. And let me be clear that Canada is no exception. We have seen countless examples of how our own internal systems have failed our Indigenous peoples across this country. Moreover, the deep history of both Dalhousie University and the province of Nova Scotia requires acknowledgement of the horrendous legacy of the slave trade and how it manifests itself now in our society and in our institutions. As a learning organization, we must also listen and learn from our Black colleagues and partners on ways we can be a more reflective, inclusive, and representative organization. We are committed to reflecting the communities in which we serve, and we will continue to work towards ensuring voices and experiences from diverse communities, especially Black communities, are reflected in our work and promoted in all our partnerships. This also means taking a hard look at our own assumptions and behaviors and initiating difficult conversations in order to improve policies, education, and culture to tackle racism internally and collectively with those partners we collaborate with globally. Our organization was founded by Lieutenant General Romeo Dallaire former force commander of the UN assistance mission in Rwanda in 1994. He witnessed firsthand how the failure to treat all people as humans resulted in more than 800,000 people being slaughtered while the world failed to heed any action. We fundamentally believe that working to put children at the forefront of achieving peace and security is imperative. 
This means understanding how the inequalities of race discrimination impede this long-term goal, both at home and abroad. When we talk about prioritizing the rights of children, we need to recognize the impact of the denial of rights of Black, Indigenous, and people of color as critical to our achievement of a world in which every child matters. Today, we are celebrating an exciting organizational change. Becoming an official institute as part of Dalhousie University here in Halifax. As an institute, we will commit to building a global agenda on children, peace and security. Through continuing to do research that helps us understand the ways children are vulnerable to violence, finding the gaps in global policy to properly include ways that recognize the agency to positively affect change that young people have and to offer practical, tangible solutions to impact this change. In order to prevent the recruitment and use of children in violence, be it for trafficking, sexual violence, criminal networks, radicalization, armed forces, groups or gangs, we have to recognize the interconnected links between these violations and global trends that may drive the increased exploitation of children. We will continue to increase collaboration with a variety of global partners, ranging from humanitarian actors to legal perspectives, to community groups, to government leaders, to non-governmental organizations, military forces and members, police officers, and our local and national, as well as international Dalhousie community in order to center and reinforce the protection and rights of children so that we can achieve a more peaceful, inclusive, and secure world. It's time we start a new revolution, one that begins with the protection of children as central to our planning, preparation, and thinking on how to create a better world. 2020 has demonstrated that now, more than ever, we need innovation, we need resilience and accountability that takes into account the legacy we will leave for future generations. This is the context for our discussions and our celebrations today. And I wanna now take this time to welcome our founder, Lieutenant General Romeo Dallaire. I'm welcome, here. sir. <laughs> welcome to this momentous occasion. How are you doing today? It is a beautiful sunny day here in, uh, along the St. Lawrence River, south, or sorry, east of Quebec City. And uh, Surviving the pandemic, I think, very positively by spending more time at home and having a chance to gather around uh, in a place that I've come to enjoy immensely. It's great to have you, sir. And I know that um, today is a, is a big day for you and I in particular. And yes. the conversation that I wanted us to have was a bit about thinking about the early days of when you first created what was then called the Child Soldiers Initiative. Maybe you can just relay for people what it was like back then, you know, what would it look, have looked like when you were working on this at that time? Well, the, the start point was, of course, uh, that, that uh, year or nearly a year I spent uh, at, at Harvard and did the initial study. And I'm glad to see uh, uh, Ambassador O'Neill is also with us today. And she was part of that team of, of extraordinary students at the Kennedy School that joined me to do some of the initial work and in the field too. But then, the, you know, the interesting part is, is that all these, I surrounded myself with colleagues uh, from the military mostly, uh, some people from the Pearson Center at the time, a couple of academics, yeah, but uh, it was a real theoretical model we were trying to figure out and uh, in, in a very, very cold and sort of distant uh, dogmatic way of looking at this, um, what we described as a military problem, a security problem, that was for sure. Uh, that was, happened until you appeared. 
<laughs> and I became this pain in your butt for the next 10 years. And, well, geez, or 11 years or whatever. Because <laughs> it, it, I still remember that uh, that meeting that we had in Phoenix. Uh, and imagine it was cheaper to have that meeting in Phoenix than it was in Ottawa at the time. And you you were there, and uh, Ben even had his uh, guitar. Uh, and uh, you threw a wrench in the whole concept of how we were going about this because it wasn't feel practical. Uh, it, it, it just, and it lacked an ability to make that bridge between the security and the humanitarian side of that. And of course, although there was certain rigor from a military perspective, it wasn't academically strong. Uh, and so after you threw everything out the window for us, uh, and but offered offered uh, to take us in uh, at Dalhousie uh, and maneuvered with the, the staffs there to find us a corner. And I got to tell you, it was a corner without a window for, for a while. Uh, <laughs> yeah, in a, fact, that is an important point, sir, to relay yeah. to everyone that maybe in the beginning for them to understand, I was the deputy director of the Center for Foreign Policy Studies at mm -hmm. Dalhousie was how I first got involved with you to start to have these discussions, not with an intention to lead this organization you were in, but just to find a way to meaningfully get, in, uh, meaningfully get involved. And uh, I was literally in a, the smallest office I think that exists at Dalhousie because it literally was a closet that got turned into an office at the end of a corridor. Yeah, and they and they had a huge room uh, for for having people can have lunch and so on to <laughs> have tea, uh, and uh, I still remember trying to convince the the, the dean and the, the head of the department to divide it up so that we could use it, and the reception was absolutely horrible. But uh, I think it's important to say though, uh, sorry, that it took only nanoseconds to realize that it needed a, a strong leadership to move this thing on the ground with depth uh, on not only the experiential side that I had, uh, but actually the intellectual side that you were able to bring and to maneuver. So uh, that initial little team, the few of us uh, grew uh, out of nothing, literally. And, and if you remember, I didn't even have the money to pay and uh, salaries or anything like that. We were scrounging money left, right, and center. And I was in the Senate trying to fiddle some, some research money. So uh, yeah. we had very little help at that time. Yeah, it's important to recall that because I, I remember there was very little money in the bank account and it needed <laughs> to be able to pay <clears throat> one staff member we were able to pay and bring from Search for Common Ground, Helen Senior and, and yeah. Tanya Zayed who was central to us in the beginning. She was working with you out of Ottawa, uh, out of your Senate offices, but you were paying for her out of your um, profits from your, from your first book. And uh, so that was personal money you were paying for her. I wasn't paid for the first six months. Helen, I had enough money for three months. And uh, certainly like to say that we were living on fumes was uh, an underestimation of uh, <laughs> what we were and, doing in the beginning. And, and under duress in the sense that the rest of the department was not necessarily the friendliest place to try to scrounge room from. And yeah. so uh, the, the, as, as space is always a, a problem. And so uh, we had the elbow left, right, and center. But yeah. from that, there was, there was an ability to articulate that we had something that nobody else had. Yeah. And, and uh, that this, uh, this link that we were able to make with the security side of the house, the military, particularly the security, the police when they brought in, uh, and the humanitarian, but then also the academic intellectual side, because right from the very original start, having started at, at, a, at a place like Harvard, I felt it was absolutely essential that this was not an anecdotal based NGO. This was an intellectually rigorous work, piece of work that could be translated into uh, metrics that would provide guidance for policy that ultimately would 
interpret itself into the field and, and field applicable. Uh, and so that, all that, putting that together, that became your mantra. And uh, you, 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 you pulled it together uh, with my occasional visits only. <laughs> but I think, sir, <clears throat> the other point that you've raised that is an important one is that I do think that both you and I believed very strongly that we could make it work that there was something exceptionally valuable about what this organization was trying to do. And it was needed and it was necessary. And though you came at it from a military perspective and from a policy background, you know, because then you were in the Senate at that time, and mine more from a, an experience of working in peace processes, working with NGOs, but also working in academic. And that was the mix that we felt was so important to carry through the organization to what it is today. The, it, it, it became fascinating to see people's eyes change when we explained how we looked at the problem, that we weren't looking at the back end of, of what child soldiers uh, looked like once they had gone through horrors of being a child soldier in conflict, but that we were actually looking at the front end and that we wanted, we wanted to prevent these kids being recruited, let alone used. And there was an absolute essential need because I was working a lot on uh, the veterans and looking at the soldiers who had been psychologically affected, including my own injury. Uh, to, to realize that we just could not continue to use kinetic force against children without having other options of looking at how to make them ineffective without mm -hmm. having to, to destroy them. I wanted to also say that um, it's not that we never had disagreements and we still I can have disagreements. <laughs> Yeah. But I, I think that it's important for people to understand that uh, when you're doing something that's difficult in the world, it's important to have different ideas and viewpoints. And when we disagree, we can come up with some of the best solutions. I, I still remember the staff in, in Ottawa saying, this is going nowhere. And, 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 and uh, the, the few bucks, you, you know, and, and it, it just made no sense to continue this. And then I, I, I'd say, no, it, it, it's important. Then I'd go to Halifax or, uh, and then we would, <laughs> we'd go at each other on, on, no, that's, this is too much humanitarian. This is not looking at the problem from the, the soldier and, and the field. And of course, uh, how we would move forward, you know, how mm -hmm. we would get funding and who to convince and how to, how to do that. I mean, I'd never done any fundraising. I mean, uh, and in fact, I wasn't even authorized to do any. To. Yes. Yeah, right. as a senator, mm -hmm. it was it was a good. So uh, how do you how do you talk to people, convince them, and then don't ask them for money? <laughs> and that's where you'd step in. <laughs> and and Lori. Oh, that was the moment Laurie, you had to exit the room. <laughs> that's right. I mean, I, there it is. I'm, I'm selling a product, and then I got to turn on. And then there are other occasions where I insult a, a blatantly <laughs> a donor who started to give us 100,000 bucks. I insulted them because I thought it was getting a million and they ended up with 300,000. So maybe <laughs> there were some lessons being learned in, in the process. Yeah, absolutely, sir. Okay. Um, I know you and I could talk for, for days about these early days, or as you would call them, the war stories. Um, yeah. But <laughs> I would like to just ask you very quickly to maybe leave everyone here with one significant moment you can remember about some of our, our work together. We've traveled all over the world to many places um, mm. and not in luxurious conditions. Mm. Um, so maybe you, could, maybe you can relay one of those um, special moments. Well, being founder, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to sneak in too, very fast. <laughs> one the the one is a field one, and this is when you and I were in South Sudan, 
and uh, nobody was getting anywhere with the government and the forces and uh, even UNICEF. And uh, we said, we'll do something. And we went into that uh, little, little village uh, in South Sudan that had been under duress and under fire and so on. Uh, and in the space of an hour and a half, you and I uh, convinced those military and political people and we ended up with nearly 300 children released to us there, then and there, which proved that we were able to convince people to, to, to move the R6. And, and the two of us pulled that off at the surprise of, of the, the, in fact, the surprise of the world because it was impossible. The other, the other one was a high point when we, you and I briefed the chief of defense staff and the minister of defense and all the senior members of all the whole ministry of defense and, and, and military, all the stars you could see in, in, in the Milky Way were there. They had never done that before, brought them all together. And the two of us put on that PowerPoint and that cracked the code uh, to get a lot of work done. And lastly, certainly the, the meeting with the Pope being called forward and having uh, done that event and seeing uh, that incredible man take notes, literally take notes and following that take action uh, to support us was a, a high watermark uh, from that. The rest is all so many experiences also with the staffs and the various staffs and me trying to, <laughs> to talk less army and talk more uh, civilian, all that was all part of it. <laughs> Thank you, sir. It's been a Thank pleasure you. to um, have this moment to celebrate this personally with you. Yeah, and yeah. Um, as we walk through the rest of the day, we're gonna say thanks to a lot of different people and have a lot of interesting conversations. Um, I'm gonna turn it to you now, sir, to introduce this short video. Yes, in fact, and, and thank you very much for that. Uh, it's uh, an opportunity uh, to uh, give uh, a voice to the institution uh, and to permit us uh, to say thanks and also to recognize uh, the efforts there. And so if you would, please turn on that magic machine and let's see this extraordinary video. Shelley is the core of uh, my ability to achieve my mission. To the extent that she has made it her mission also uh, of uh, ultimately, we hope, making use of children as weapons of war unthinkable. And so uh, she has been able to bring the intellectual discipline, uh, the incredibly analytical skills. She's also brought a lot of courage of taking on some pretty stupid people sometimes and some pretty nasty people and courageously defend our, our product, our work, our efforts. Uh, internally even, you know, within the internal politics of any organization, meaning the, the university stuff, let alone internationally she's got an effort, ethical framework and a work ethic that's that's uh, that's uh, pretty hard to beat so I consider her uh, the core of the organization and from her radiates our ability to achieve the mission I bring certain assets to it uh, but I bring also my military perspective uh, as I try to understand and work within the humanitarian the academic and so on she was she's already been down that road uh, she's worked with the humanitarians she's worked in academia uh, she's worked also with militaries and so uh, 
she far more personifies this newer generation of multidisciplinary leaders. And, and so she really is, is in, in a significant leadership role with the mission uh, that we have. And I often like to simply say that I'm there reinforcing and, and giving her just that much more sustainment, uh, giving her a, a strategic backdrop to work with by my reputation, my contacts, and what I can do, and sometimes also my uh, my leadership experience from, from the past. But I am far more in reinforcement and assisting in uh, permitting her to blossom with the organization uh, into a, an effective body. So thank you very much, uh, General Dallaire, for introducing that video. Thank you all for watching. We want to take this moment to thank some really critical supporters to the Dallaire Institute over the last 10 years plus. And some of these people have been key to uh, our Founders Fund, our, our friends of the Dallaire Institute. They've been people who have helped us in terms of supporting the work both financially as well as from uh, mentorship and expertise that they have given. And so I'd like to start to go through that uh, list of, of key individuals and to thank them. Uh, General Dallaire, would you like to start with some of the, the list that you have before you? <laughs> if... <laughs> <clears throat> And you're, you're on mute, sir, so if we can unmute you. Yes, I'm, I'm looking for that text in front of me. Yes, uh, <laughs> I, can, I can begin if you would like. Would you, would you do that, please? Yeah. Sure, thanks. sure. And maybe you can just add in a few words as we go. So yeah. these are the kinds of technical glitches we have on a, the uh, virtual space. So we'd like to take this moment to thank, in particular, James Mossman, who was there from the very beginning, Power Corp. Michael and Jackie Donovan, uh, the Pearson Peacekeeping Center, the Search for Common Ground, UNICEF, the University of Winnipeg, the University of Victoria, and groups like Human Rights Watch, the United States Institute for Peace, um, IDRC, the Compton Foundation, and the Legatum Foundation, who are some of the initial funders to some of the key work that we've been doing, to UNIFOR, to Andrew Molson and the Molson Foundation, to Paul Demery Jr., to Gerard Veilleux, to John and Ann Irving, Prem Watsa, Jim Stanford, and JP Vich, who have been some of the key people in the initial days, to the Carnegie Foundation, uh, DHX Media, Leslie McLean, Scott Maxwell and Wounded Warriors Canada, Susan Gibson, Charles Brindamore and Intact Financial, who have been the most tremendous donors to us and continue to support our work around the world. To Gary and Donna Slate for believing in us with the Slate Family Foundation's incredible work that uh, they have funded us to do over the next few years. To Bruce McKean. Bruce is a very special philanthropic donor to us who absolutely believes in our work and we're so grateful for all of his efforts to help us with the knowledge for prevention work that we are doing. To Heather Reisman, who supported us uh, as well in our early days in uh, Rwanda. And more recently, some significant institutional donors I'd like to give recognition to, the Government of Canada. Both the Department of National Defense and Global Affairs Canada have been significant to some of the key milestones we've achieved. And the German Foreign Federal Office, their work and their support to our work to the African Center of Excellence and to the work in Rwanda. 
are all really foundational pieces that will continue um, to help us globally. So General, are there any last words you'd like to add in there? Thank you very much, though, no, because I didn't see the list, and, but I want to thank and reinforce with you James Mossman, who found the initial money needed that I could do that research at Harvard and has continued to help us. He's sort of the elder statesman of our donors and, and continues to be like that. And the new generation of CEOs who are engaged in the international sphere and looking well beyond our own country, uh, like Charles Brindamour, who's been, who and his firm have been outstanding uh, supporters and guidance and provide us with inputs. Uh, and uh, uh, Paul Desmarais Jr., who came to the field uh, with Jim Stanford and saw us do our work and convinced uh, that it was well worth the investment they were doing uh, to support us and thank all who continued to donate to us and to the Ministry of National Affairs Government in Canada and the Prime Minister who's had the patience to meet with us at least a few times, Shelley, to thank him and the organizations uh, that the Government of Canada has provided us with. Absolutely. So sir, um, next we're going to um, have a video that comes from our well-wishers here at Dalhousie University and some of the Dalhousie events that we've held over the years that have been quite significant uh, events. So we want to have this video to celebrate our institutional home, Dalhousie University, and some very special anniversary wishes from some of our friends. So please, let's go to the video. Hello, my name is Deep Saini. I'm president and vice chancellor of Dalhousie University. It's a matter of great pride for me to say congratulations to the Delay Institute for completing 10 years of outstanding work in preventing the use of children as weapons of war. You have done amazing work over the past 10 years and I wish you all the best for continued impact and great work that you do around the world. All the best and congratulations. Good afternoon, I'm Scott Bryson, Dalhousie University Chancellor. It's my pleasure to congratulate the Dallaire Institute on its 10 year anniversary at Dalhousie and to express how proud we are to be your partner and home in your mission to end the recruitment and use of child soldiers. From Halifax, Nova Scotia, the Dallaire Institute has reached around the world to bring the perspective of the security sector to the issue of child soldiers. Your efforts have influenced policy and practice to elevate children's well-being on the international peace and security agenda. On behalf of all of us at Dalhousie, I thank the dedicated team at the Dallaire Institute for all you've done and are doing to end the use of children as weapons of war. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Stephen Lewis, and from time to time I'm asked to engage in these celebratory occasions, and nothing gives me greater pleasure than to participate in this one, because the decade of accomplishment by Romeo Dallaire's Child Soldiers Initiative, and now morphed into the Institute for the Children, Peace and Security, uh, it's hard to imagine any other organization, well, virtually any other organization that has made such a contribution to the well-being and security and safety of children in believered countries worldwide. So, Mr. General and Shelley and colleagues, my congratulations to you. Bravo. It's a great day to celebrate the Land Institute for Children. 10 years anniversary, peace and security. Now as an ex-child soldier, to be able to find that there are people around the world who are still putting the fight and keeping the candle burning 
it gives me joy it gives me hope to continue to stay alive so this is me to send my wishes and may you guys continue to make our world become better and better you'll never know the potential of any human being unless that person is given an opportunity the delaya institute for children is doing that Warmest congratulations to the Dallaire Institute on 10 years at Dalhousie University. It is remarkable to think it's been a decade since you bumped in with the Center for Foreign Policy Studies in the Political Science Department, and even more remarkable to reflect back on the growth and the reach and the successes that you've had in your mission in the 10 years since you arrived. Uh, congratulations on this milestone. Congratulations on becoming an institute. and best wishes in the work that lies ahead. Wonderful. Thank you everyone for those well wishes. Uh next I am really pleased to introduce a very special friend to the Delair Institute, Dr. Frank Harvey. He is here to host our next segment. Dr. Harvey is currently serving as Dalhousie's Provost and Vice President Academic Acting. He served as Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at Dalhousie University from 2016 to 2020 and was chair of the Department of Political Science from 2014 to 2016. He held the Fulbright Distinguished Research Chair at Yale University in 2018 and currently holds the Eric Dennis Memorial Chair of Government and Politics at Dalhousie. Dr. Harvey received Dalhousie's Alumni Association Award for Excellence in Teaching in 2012. He has also been awarded Dalhousie's Outstanding Graduate Advisor Award of 2009, Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences Award for Teaching Excellence in 1998, and he was a NATO Research Fellow from 1998 to 2000. He has received several awards and grants from bodies such as the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada. the Department of National Defense and the Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade but most importantly I just wanted to take this moment to express my deep gratitude Dr. Harvey for all of your support to me personally to the Delair Institute and to continuing to help us to find ways to impact children peace and security globally Thank you very much Shelley Uh, and thank you, General Delaire, for the incredibly kind invitation to join everyone today and to participate in uh, in the event celebrating 10 years of the Delaire Initiative, and now, of course, the Delaire Institute and its impact at uh, at Dalhousie and globally. I have been at Dalhousie for about 30 years now. I have been working with Shelley for. quite a while uh starting from when she served as associate director of the Center for Foreign Policy Studies in the Department of Political Science so I have had the privilege and the pleasure to witness Shelley and to witness General Delair take a very noble cause create a vision for the Delair Institute and build a long-term mission set of principles and a legacy for one of the most important and widely recognized human rights organizations in the world I am so excited to facilitate this particular conversation with our grad students uh and panelists today who uh have contributed in different ways to building on that really important legacy. So let me take a second to introduce the panelists and then I'll work my way through some questions for them. Dustin Johnson is a senior research officer at the Delair Institute. He completed his undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering from Dalhousie in 2013. He moved on to complete a Masters of Resource and Environmental Management from Dal in 2015 and he is now pursuing a PhD degree at the School of Global Studies in the at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. Alyssa Walsh is a Communications and Research Assistant at the Delair Institute. Alyssa began working at the institute while completing her uh, BA 
uh, uh, combined honors in history and political science, go political science uh, in 2019, and is currently pursuing a master's in political science at Dalhousie. That's great news. Um, Paige Black is an advocacy officer at the Dallaire Institute. Uh, Paige graduated in 2018 uh, from Dalhousie with a Bachelor of Arts degree in International Development Studies and a certificate in cross-cultural uh, communication. And finally, Sarah Douglas is a 2020 Shulik School of Law graduate, uh, currently uh, articling with uh, McInnes Cooper. Sarah volunteered with the Dallaire Institute and is currently working on a uh, policy alignment tool and early construction of a children, peace and security agenda. So welcome everyone uh, to the panel. I've been given a few questions and I'd like to start off with uh, Paige and Sarah and we'll keep in that order. And the question is, how did you get involved with the Institute initially? Uh, we'll start with Paige. Thanks, Frank. Um, and I love this question because uh, the Delaire Institute actually um, pushed me to choose Dalhousie. Um, it was part of the reason I decided to come here was because there was work happening here that I had been interested in for a long time. I made my parents drive me the two hours when General launched, launched the Institute in 2010. So um, it, was, it was really great to be here you know, when they were hosting lectures and things on campus. So it just really added uh, to my Dalhousie experience. Um, then I ended up in my last year taking Shelley's course, uh, which I would highly recommend to any student, even as an elective. Um, then I ended up volunteering. You just, you, you, if you choose something that you're interested in, you just keep, uh, keep at it and find any opportunity you can, which is what I always tell especially undergraduate students, um, it'll help you find the things that you're really passionate about. And that's one of my favorite things about Dalhousie is that there's so many things on campus to get involved in. And uh, it certainly worked out very well for me. I'm sure that's not the <laughs> exactly what will happen for everyone, but uh, I was very fortunate to volunteer, be a research student um, and have a job here before my graduation ceremony. Um, so that, that's how I got started. Thanks very much, Paige. And by the way, it's been a real pleasure working with you over the last uh, few years and, and getting to know you through the various Dallaire uh, Initiative and Institute events. Um, so thank you for all your work. Sarah, same question. How did you get involved with the Institute? Thanks so much, Frank. And uh, just a good afternoon to uh, General Dallaire and Shelley and uh, everyone else who's been able to, to join us today. Um, I was aware of the general's work and uh, the the work of the initiative as it then was uh, before I started at law school. But once I was there, I really developed um, more of a keenness for international law. And I really wanted more practical experience and to be able to further develop my research skills actually while I was there. And I was also having uh, transitioned from a prior career, I was also looking for more volunteer opportunities within my new uh, to, profession to be. Um, and so I uh, offered to volunteer with the initiative. Uh, I met with Dustin <laughs> uh, to talk about volunteering with the initiative. Um, and it wasn't just about my personal relationship with the initiative as a student at the Shulik School of Law, but also uh, I wanted to help develop a more formal relationship between, uh, between those two organizations. So I proposed a more formal relationship between um, the, the law school's pro bono society uh, so that that relationship could continue and more, more law students who I'm sure would be uh, very pleased to ha have that opportunity to, to also volunteer with the Institute uh, will be able to do that in future because um, I knew I would only be there so long <laughs> at, at, at law school. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, next question, uh, I'll, I'll uh, throw at Dustin and Alyssa. Um, what impact, we'll start with Dustin, what impact did your involvement with the Institute have uh, on both your education, but also your career path? Thanks, Frank, and it's great to be on this afternoon. Um, the Institute's really, and the initiative before, has had a quite substantial impact on my career path. Uh, I first got involved when I was working on my master's degree at Dalhousie, and really my first experience getting involved, aside from a couple events on campus, was 
uh, projects through the Masters Without or Management Without Borders program in the uh, Masters program there. And I worked on a project for the uh, initiative at that time, working on a social media strategy. Uh, this is a course we've continued engaging with throughout the years. I'm actually currently working with two project teams there now. Um, and at that time, I'd been generally thinking of a career somewhere in the realm of international development or humanitarian aid, but had pretty diverse interests from things related to armed conflict to more environmental field. Um, and it was really through the initiative and some other work I was doing around the time that pushed me towards uh, having more greater focus on armed conflict and especially working that semester and then continued doing a bit of volunteer work. Um, and then the next summer took Shelley's course as final course of my master's um, that really made me particularly interested and passionate about uh, the specific focus of the uh, is initiative in the institute. Um, and then after I graduated, I was looking around for different career opportunities, was applying to jobs, did some small pieces of work for uh, Shelley at that time. Um, and then eventually this was the first full-time job I was able to get after my master's. And since then I've been on board all the way. I've really enjoyed working here and it's really set me on a, a career trajectory. Thanks very much, uh, Dustin. And just to uh, highlight your reference to Shelley's course, it is and has become one of the most popular courses uh, at Dalhousie. And, and uh, clearly from the feedback from students after taking the course and given their experience with you know, serving officers or retired officers it's, uh, and, and, and uh, retired officials who've been working in and around areas tied to international development studies, it's incredible. Um, opportunity for uh, students to experience that kind of interaction and that kind of uh, mentorship. Uh, so thanks very much. Uh, Alyssa, same question to you. What impact did your involvement with the Institute have on your education and your career path? Yes, thank you, Frank. Um, and, and thank you all. It's a pleasure to be here today with you. Um, when I started at Dal, I thought I wanted to work in government and I was just finishing a two-year um, contract with the provincial government when I saw the posting for my first uh, internship with the initiative at the time initiative. Um, that was three and a half years ago. So I think it's pretty clear the um, impact it's had on my career and my education choices. Um, it was very quickly that I knew there was no turning back once I started working here. Um, it shaped the, I was going into my third year after that first internship and it shaped the courses I took, the papers I wrote, um, and the path that I decided to pursue with my life. So I didn't expect I would be here today when I was in my first year of university at Dal, um, but these are also experiences I wouldn't have been able to have anywhere else. So thank you. Thanks, Alyssa. Um, I'm going to pose this question to uh, Paige, Sarah, Dustin, and Alyssa, all uh, of the panelists. Um, and the question is, what's next for the Dallaire Institute's DAL grads? I guess there's two ways to interpret it. One is, what kind of advice would you offer to students who are thinking about being a Dallaire Institute DAL grads? And second way to interpret, I guess, is what's next for you? Uh, some of you touched on this, but if you want to expand on that, that's great. So we'll start with uh, Paige and then move to Sarah, Dustin, and Melissa. Paige? Awesome. Thanks, Frank. And yeah, like I said earlier to students, I would highly suggest that they get involved. Um, we, we really enjoy working with students. I also similarly started as a research student working with Dustin. So he's uh, with a Dow grad himself who started here and then has welcomed uh, many more of us since. Um, and in terms of what's next, um, it's a really exciting time. We're expanding our advocacy work, uh, which is what I focus on. Um, we're having a lot of conversations around what's going on in Cameroon, Cameroon and with partners there um, and looking at if we can shift our focuses in some ways and expand to talk about peace processes and how children really need to be uh, included. So I, that and you'll be happy to hear, Dean Harvey, I'm also looking at doing my master's in the next year. So <laughs> That's great news. Thank you, Paige. Sarah? Yes, thank you so much. Um, well, my story might not be as interesting as <laughs> everyone else here, but uh, as a recent grad, um, I am sort of in this environment now, I am learning about the practice of law and certainly in the private sector at the moment. Um, and I have certain requirements that I have to meet uh, in order to enter this profession. Uh, so that kind of requires a lot of my focus at the moment, but um, and, and just sort of chiming in a little bit in the, on the last question as well is that 
um, the impact that the Institute has had on my education uh, and my and my future, I, I think is um, uh, yet to be seen in its entirety. Uh, we are currently working on ways that we can continue our collaboration, uh, even though I'm no longer at Dalhousie. Uh, and so I'm, I'm very, very um, optimistic that uh, I'll be able to maintain some, some relationship going forward with the Institute. Fantastic, thank you, Sarah. Dustin? Yeah, I'd really like to echo what Paige said about um, getting involved as a student with the Institute or with other organizations on campus or in the community. I think it's had a huge impact on all of us here and many other students, and there's so many opportunities in different programs. Uh, for me, I'm just finishing the first year of my PhD doing re research with the uh, Institute and looking at gender and child protection in you know, peacekeeping, which is an incredibly important topic for us. Um, so I'm very excited for the future of that research and then continuing to do research on these topics with the Institute in the future. And I think our expanding relationship and new um, situation within Dalhousie is going to be extremely important for that and building new relationships and collaboration. Thanks very much, Dustin. Uh, Alyssa. Thank you, yes. Um, well, next is definitely finishing my master's. Um, four years at Dal wasn't enough, so um, I'm nearing the end of my second degree here. Um, but as soon as that's over, I just hope to continue to dedicate as much as I can to this cause and to this field. Um, what I would say to uh, any other young people watching this today, thinking about getting involved, um, if you are looking for something that could truly shape your career, I want to emphasize that the learning doesn't end in university, the growing doesn't end there. And I'm lucky that with this organization, I have so many people I can look up to, people that inspire me each and every day, people that I consider mentors. Um, so to be working in a place like this so early on in my career, I'm truly, truly um, grateful for that. And I hope you take those words as a, a encouragement to get involved with our organization or an organization like ours um, as you begin your incredible journey. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alyssa. Such great, uh, insightful answers. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Paige, Sarah, Dustin, Alyssa. It is so easy to see why the Dallaire Initiative is so successful when you have such incredible uh, team members. So thank you very much for joining us for this special event. Uh, and now I'll throw it back over to Shelley. Hi, Frank. Very sorry. That was a small technical glitch. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> thank you for that uh, panel that you've just hosted. That was really um, incredible and um, really great to have you here with us today. Uh, I wanted to just take this opportunity now to introduce uh, a video that comes from the government of Canada with well wishes from many of our uh, most senior officials. Hello everyone, bonjour à tous. I'm happy to join you all to celebrate 10 years of the Dallaire Institute. For a decade, this exceptional initiative has been working towards a global vision to prevent the recruitment and use of children in conflict. Because children should not fight wars. And through research and programming, Romeo Dallaire's Child Soldiers Initiative has impacted policy, mobilized communities, and is making a real and substantial difference around the world. Notre gouvernement est fier d'adhérer à cette vision pour appuyer l'Institut Dallaire. Voilà pourquoi on a annoncé l'établissement du Centre d'excellence Dallaire pour la paix et la sécurité en 2019. Et c'est également pourquoi les Forces armées canadiennes font la promotion des principes de Vancouver sur le maintien de la paix et la prévention du recrutement et de l'utilisation des enfants soldats. We all have a role to play in protecting and supporting children's rights and achieving global peace and security for everyone. Romeo, mon ami, merci pour ton leadership indéfectible et ta compassion dans cet enjeu tellement important. Continue ton bon travail. I want to thank the Dallaire Institute for their work over the past decade as well. And I look forward to continuing to work with them to ensure the protection of children around the world. 
Thank you all, and congratulations on this milestone. Stay safe and healthy, everyone. Happy 10th anniversary to the Delaire Child Soldiers Initiative, which has recently become a formal institute at Dalhousie University, the Delaire Institute for Children, Peace, and Security. And today we're highlighting and celebrating a decade of hard work dedicated to ending the recruitment and the use of children as soldiers around the world. An institution which all Canadians can be proud of that truly makes a difference for women, children, men, and countries undergoing crises. To all of you who support these objectives, congratulations, and it is my hope that the work started by General Romeo Dallaire continues for many decades to come. On behalf of the Government of Canada and the Minister of Foreign Affairs, I'm pleased to have the opportunity to congratulate the Dallaire Institute for Children, Peace and Security on becoming a formal institute at Dalhousie University. General Dallaire, Romeo, I appreciate your tireless personal efforts and those of the Institute in preventing and ending the scourge of child soldiers around the world, as well as for your overall contributions to peacekeeping and conflict prevention. These contributions were instrumental in the development and launch of the Vancouver Principles in 2017 and will help support their implementation today. We look forward to continuing to work with the Dallaire Institute and other partners in Canada and around the world to advance those principles and to ensure that the rights of children are protected in every conflict context. We're grateful for you, for the Institute, and for the important work you have been doing and will continue to do and wish you all the very best for many more years to come. Thank you. Hello everyone, it's Andy Fillmore, Member of Parliament for Halifax, home to the Dallaire Institute for Children, Peace and Security at Dalhousie University. Well, I wish we were all getting together at Dalhousie in person right now, as in years past, but for now I hope that you'll accept this virtual greeting. On behalf of the Government of Canada, it's my great honour to congratulate the Romeo Dallaire Child Soldiers Initiative on 10 remarkable years of tireless work for the protection of children and children's rights. I must recognize in particular a Canadian hero and a man I'm honored to call friend, Lieutenant General Romeo Dallaire. Today's achievement is but one in his remarkable career and service to Canada and to the world's most vulnerable. Thank you, Lieutenant General. And tremendous thanks also to Shelley and the whole entire extraordinary team at the Dallaire Institute. As a father and as a Canadian, there are a few things that's horrifying to think about as a child being used as a weapon of war. But the tragic fact is there are an estimated 300,000 child soldiers engaged in armed hostilities around the world. And it's another difficult reality that the presence of children in armed conflicts, particularly as child soldiers, puts our Canadian armed forces in an almost impossible predicament. Yet as we've heard many times over the last couple of years, when it comes to addressing the global challenges that disrupt the peace and prosperity of our planet and its people, the world needs more Canada. And so your government has made one of its international priorities the protection and education of children affected by armed conflict. And to this end, we're so fortunate to have such an effective partner in the Dallaire Institute for Children, Peace and Security. As we mark 10 years of your important work, Allow me once more to offer the Government of Canada's deepest gratitude. Our work continues, but for now, congratulations. Well done. What an honour and delight it is to be congratulating my friends and longtime colleagues at the Dallaire Institute for Children, Peace and Security on the occasion of your 10th anniversary. General Dallaire and Dr. Whitman, your leadership of the Institute's critical efforts to respect and protect the rights of children, and in particular to prevent the abhorrent usage of children as weapons of war, is to be lauded. I join you in joyous celebration of this milestone as you redouble the Dallaire Institute's efforts to ensure that all children everywhere thrive and grow up to enjoy and contribute to peaceful and prosperous societies. Congratulations, my dear friends, on 10 amazing years. En tant qu'institut, vous êtes des partenaires formidables. Vous êtes toujours partant pour collaborer. Vous centrez la voix des enfants et des jeunes. Vous êtes des leaders d'opinion et vous le faites de manière inclusive en amenant les femmes la paix et la sécurité dans la conversation. Now please, though, as you get all of this very well-deserved praise, General Dallaire, 
I hope you do not forget your humble beginnings envisioning this initiative over pizza parties that you hosted for your very grateful and always very hungry student researchers. Thanks to you, General, to Dr. Whitman, and to all of your tremendous team around the world, and congratulations once again. Hello, General Vance. Hey, Shelly. Good to see you. <clears throat> hello, nice. hello, Chief. Go ahead, General Delaire. You hey, can... Romeo. Bonjour, Senator. Ça va? Ça va, ça va, mon cher. Let's put that in, in uh, pas une courte présentation, but an in, in introduction, si vous permettez. Uh, first of all, thanks, thanks to everyone who's uh, today have been joining us uh, from the government, uh, the Prime Minister, the Minister of Defense, the Associate Minister of Foreign Affairs, Ambassador of Women, Peace and Security, Mary Coyle, a Senator and, and so on. Uh, and we're very, very proud uh, of their words and of their support. And I will get to uh, the Canadian Forces and the Chief uh, in a moment. However, this is, although our 10th anniversary uh, these days, there's something else that, if I may, just bring to the table, to the discussion. And this is the fact that we are marking the beginning of Veterans Week here, and where the honor of those who serve Canada, past and present. My dad was one of them, and in times of war, as your dad, Jonathan, was, and served so well, and I remember well. In military conflicts and in peace, they served. We rightly look back to those who made the ultimate sacrifice, of course, laying down their own life for service of greater good. However, those who have served and continue to suffer in their minds and bodies must be remembered and respected also. They're part of the casualties of war and the commitment of this nation. Now, during this pandemic year where solemn traditions of remembrance will be altered, uh, let us not forget the key milestones and battles that led to the 75th anniversary, and we were there, uh, Chief, uh, together of the Second World War, an important part of Canada's history. We were part of the three armies that crossed those beaches on that memorable day and fought through in the country where I was born, through Holland. Today, wars are no longer waged so solely on the domain of state armies and fighting over clearly defined political and physical boundaries. Conflicts are increasingly, well, nasty, if not dirty affairs, with shifting alliances and enemies hiding in plain sight, in which the laws of armed conflict only apply to those who choose, in fact, to follow them. Encountering child soldiers can be profoundly injurious for military personnel because such a phenomenon deeply conflicts the fundamental cultural, religious, and personal perceptions of children as innocent souls. These exposures adversely affect the military personnel. And while many of the symptoms are similar to PTSD, moral injury is thought to be a distinct construct due to its association with the feelings of shame, of guilt, of worthlessness, of changes of world beliefs, even of self-blame certainly lived through that for so many decades. This Veterans Week lets us not only remember the fallen, but those who continue to live with the lifelong effects of violence and war in their minds, in their bodies, while we find proactive and preventive solutions to addressing their moral injuries. For them, the wars are not over, they live them, and to their families, and to the impact on their families, and how they can continue to serve their loved ones in getting better and living a decent life as an injured veteran in this country. Uh, we're thrilled, truly, uh, Chief uh, General Jonathan Vance, uh, to have you with us. And a few words, if I may. We've, we've 
We've seen you deploy across the globe on the numerous times of service in Canada, including two tours in Afghanistan as the commander of the Joint Task Force against of Afghanistan and the Task Force in Kandahar. You awarded the Meritorious Service Cross twice and the commander of the Order of Military Merit and was awarded an MID. My dad got an MID and a bridge too far near Arkham. But getting an MID for leadership during peacekeeping operations in Carisha was a whole different world, of course, that you uh, lived and experienced with your troops uh, in your command. From launching Operation Honor to combat harmful behavior within the ranks, leading significant change in combat development and being the first chief of defense staff to launch a brand new doctrine on children and armed conflict in NATO. This is part of your legacy to developing improved personnel policies enabling the Canadian Armed Forces to conduct now and into the future uh, the operations that it requires to meet the challenges that continue to affect war but continue to affect those who serve in this conflict. Let me, if I may, end my introduction by saying thanks, dear colleague, veteran serving and You've done well for five years in that extraordinary job. And I would like to turn you over, if I may, to Dr. Shelley Whitman, who's going to make your life interesting for the next few moments, as she has made mine for years. Uh, Shelley, over to you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, General Dallaire, and thank you, General Vance. Um, welcome today to being with us, and I I'm really grateful you've taken the time out of your really busy schedule to be with us as you've always done uh, through the, the time that I have been engaged with you. You've been a keen supporter of this work and of the cause. And so uh, welcome. Thank you. I wanted to uh, begin just a small discussion with you today to talk about the positive relationship between the Canadian Armed Forces and what's now the Dallaire Institute. Maybe if you could give everyone a, a few words of, of your thoughts on that relationship. Well, I can give more than a few words, but uh, I would like to say hello to all of you. And I, I've, I've been ghosting uh, you guys uh, for the last little while. So I got to hear some of the, the grads talk and so on. So um, really great so far today. Um, uh, my relationship with the Institute is, uh, I think, personal and professional. It's profound. Uh, it's emotional. Um, you know, obviously, uh, through my very good friend, uh, uh, a mentor to me in many ways, uh, well, in every way, uh, an icon of military leadership and, and uh, genuine decentness in Romeo. And uh, so the connection there is, is powerful and profound. Um, and I just love him for it. It's also you, Shelley, we can't forget you. Um, you know, every, uh, you know, every vision needs someone that's actually gonna make it happen. Uh, and you've been, a, uh, you are, you are that engine. I think Romy would agree. Uh, and so I've enjoyed uh, the, the understanding uh, further of what all this is about. Uh, through you and through the lens that you provide through Dalhousie or in personal exchanges, uh, be it around the margins of Halifax Security Forum or, or elsewhere. So I want to thank you as well. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it is true that um, as, you know, I was coming into the job, uh, the, the nexus or the, the, the nature of things that affect conflict now were very apparent to me, very clear to me. I think they've been developing for a while. I had an opportunity to do some uh, important reflection on the profession of arms in Canada um, as we were dealing with uh, a whole range of changes to the character of conflict or, and, the, and the characteristics therein, uh, from cyberspace to space to all of the uh, different conflict domains that exist. Uh, which would include the information domain and the cyberspace domain, uh, including the land, air, and sea. Uh, and there's that cognitive domain uh, that we know is where moral injury can happen, moral injury can be delivered, 
Uh, and so the domains of warfare, uh, I think they probably always existed, but we've been able to identify them, categorize them and make sense of them. And of course, militarily, uh, what we do is try then to take it steps further by adding doctrine and training and understanding so that we can prevail in those domains and ultimately uh, win and win with extreme prejudice if, if we need to. And that's fine. That's who we are. Uh, and, and I make no bones about it. We not we never need to shy away from the fact that we are ultimately involved in the management of delivery of violence on behalf of Canada. If we need to, we prefer not to, but that's that's who we are. But very clearly, uh, in all of these domains, there is a moral, legal, uh, and, and sort of fundamental set of rules that guide how we work. Um, and even to the point where we could lose, we would rather, I think, hold on to values uh, and fight for values with the risk of loss, then abandon those values with a chance of, of winning or somehow prevailing differently. And so all of that was in my mind as I'm taking this job, uh, trying to steer the profession of arms forward. And it was, it's a, around that time, uh, I mean, I, I knew a little bit before, obviously, uh, since about 2010 of, of what was going on, but I had to take it uh, professionally more seriously because um, the the domain of children in conflict, the children as a, a weapon of war, but also a victims of war, also um, met very clearly the, that nexus of the multiple domains that affect how soldiers operate, that cognitive domain, uh, the information domain, uh, and just the, the, and that physical domain, uh, that, that sure. human component. So uh, all in, uh, there were professional reasons, uh, Shelley, that probably um, allowed me to crystallize what it is that we needed to do based largely on personal, perhaps emotional uh, reasons that kind of drive a commander to uh, add energy to it. Yes, absolutely. And I want to thank you also for working so closely with us on the Vancouver Principles. Um, being with you in Vancouver in 2017, I can recall personally witnessing you uh, advocating for endorsements of the of the principles with uh, many of the participants there, uh, but also for the Safe Schools Declaration. And um, I, I know that your intervention in particular made all the difference in terms of getting Canada's commitment to uh, to the Safe Schools Declaration also. Um, in addition, the CAF doctrine that came in, those uh, are for us also huge milestones to demonstrate to the rest of the world. So maybe just talk a little bit about from your perspective and remembering those, those particular dynamics. Yeah, well, you know, that was a, those were heady days. Uh, lots were on our plate. Uh, uh, the prime minister very clearly giving uh, direction and guidance to us through the through the not only the principles of safe schools initiative but also the peacekeeping initiatives um uh, and so exciting days relatively early in my tenure um and <clears throat> my my job um at that time was to try to understand uh what it was that the country wanted uh, not just what uh you know what became the institute would be able to provide but to actually you know somehow harness it contribute to it uh, and benefit from it on operations. I, in the end, uh, you know, I, I have to be able to deliver effects. I can't just admire the, uh, the problem or the issues or the success of others. We've got to contribute. So <clears throat> I think that it, born in that was the, uh, the idea of being able to produce doctrine through various instruments, including through the army, uh, how to take uh, the principles and turn them into a memoirs that are actually usable uh, but I think uh, I think what was born around that time, if not there, was the idea of having a center of excellence, uh, which we have probably launched. And you know, there's been some great work done uh, thus far. And I think we've just announced uh, that Shannon Smith will be the new executive director uh, mm -hmm. of that institute. So you know, the defense through the the Canadian Defense Academy, a mix of military and civilian uh, support will take. Uh, what is essentially um, a, a, a great idea and academic practice and, and what you've done on the ground in the field 
uh, to try and now institutionalize it. I, I, I would do nobody any favors by just being a cheerleader. I, we actually have to institutionalize things. Uh, there's no point in me standing on a soapbox and condemning sexual misconduct in the armed forces if I didn't actually do something to, to fix it. So I actually have to, uh, to, to do some work. And so we've done some work. And I'm proud of that work. Uh, very proud of it. You know, it's it, we're like anything institutional. It needs to germinate. It's got to start. It's got to. It's got to make sense for our ability to wage and and withstand conflict. Um, and it, it it has to get sort of layered in uh, with a sort of a solid basis for progressing. And I think now we're there. It's taken a while. I know you and I, you and I have had some discussions about uh, how long these things take. But, I, but you know, we have taken a major step forward by having a center of excellence. Uh, and then, you know, we've woven in, in a variety of ways. You know, I, I saw uh, Jackie O'Neill on speaking. You know, there's a whole bunch of things that, that connect uh, through that center of excellence uh, that will make us better. Uh, and I think what you would, you'll find, uh, and you have found, uh, because we've spoken of it, you know, there is resistance out there uh, to doing anything that would sort of limit your ability to operate in war, safe schools initiative. So let's pledge not to directly target schools. Well, this is, it falls into the kind of no brainer category for many of us, but um, you know, there are, there are people that say, well, there shouldn't be that kind of limit. You know, if it's, if the, the school is a legitimate target, you should shoot at it and maybe you should. Um, but in the main, there's nothing wrong with standing up for an idea that you would not uh, eliminate the place where children can go to school. Uh, and you may find other ways to make that particularly enemy position irrelevant um, as opposed to trying to destroy it uh, and irrelevant to your immediate future uh, on a battlefield. So there's all sorts of ways to, uh, to, to manage these things. And I am proud uh, that I can hold my head very high and Romeo knows it. Uh, we're a powerful, uh, professional uh, military force that can be used for a range of reasons, including the, uh, the, the difficult but necessary sometimes application of, of violence. We're good at that. We're good at the range and a whole range of things. But mm -hmm. I also think that we're, we're part of the reason why we're amongst the best in the world is that we can take the legitimate limitations to the waging of conflict and manage them in a way that ultimately makes us more credible and makes the victories that much more satisfying and enduring. And that's, can I say one more thing? I know you want to ask me a question, but I want to say one more thing. I, I, I'm told that generals aren't allowed to be limited in what they can speak. Oh, they can be, yeah, they can be, especially by professors. Um, <laughs> look, the 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 idea, uh, you know, I, I am, you know, a dyed in the wool supporter of all of the Vancouver principles and the reasons why the why why the Delaire initiative started and why it's now solidified as an institute. That you, you you won't find a, a bigger fan than me in the professional and that emotional realm. But I've got to tell you, you know, as a CDS, you've got to make things uh, work for the you know the, ultimately the delivery of government objectives uh, and and success. And one of the things that has attracted me most to this uh, is, you know, I've got a passing familiarity, I guess, with the, this, the intransigence of, of conflict. It's just, it's just not going away. Uh, these are enduring conflicts that, that we're seeing around the world. And the, the tools and techniques that we typically use haven't been working. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it doesn't mean that, uh, you know, the effort was a failure or the, the desire, or the intent, uh, but we're still seeing longstanding conflicts simmering away or hot. And clearly, we must be able to find other mechanisms uh, to um, change the situation for the better. One of those mechanisms is future generations, uh, future generations of, of actors in that space. And this is one of the reasons why, you know, we don't talk about it an awful lot. There's the protecting of the soldiers from the moral injury. There's the prevention of the immediate impact of additional combat power that children can provide. Uh, um, and then there's the, the you know, the, the horror of, of children being denied a childhood and, and being involved in conflict. But there's a longer term harm 
that means that we're never going to break free of some of these conflicts unless that you know the population finds its footing uh, through confidence by acting in different ways better ways for their their safety and future uh, so you know interrupting that violence that cycle of violence and that's where the investment in children for the same reason we invest in our kids we should uh, offshore in conflict as well and that's it, it makes sense to me I am you know having you know I'm in my sixth year in this job now and uh, I spend a lot of my time trying to figure out how it is that we uh, do the right thing to uh, be, begin to bring conclusions to some of these conflicts, terminate the conflicts, and not with extreme prejudice, but with a, a reasonable outcome. We, we must be able to provide reasonable outcomes. General Vance, you said it perfectly. Thank you so much for being with us today, and I want to thank you for always having time and commitment towards not only the Institute, but the issues um, that are of our time, as you've so rightly put it. You are, in our viewpoint, an honorary member of the Dallaire Institute team, uh, no matter if you are the CDS or not. Um, and we thank you for being a champion of change. We really hope to continue uh, to engage you well into the future. Thank you, sir, for being here today. Shelley, my pleasure. And I would, uh, uh, I would be remiss and probably uh, in trouble forever if I didn't also bring greetings from my wife, Carrie, who obviously yes. a, a big uh, fan, uh, graduate of one of your courses, uh, who also uh, being a military lawyer sees all of the advantages of what you do. So greetings from Carrie. My regards on to her also. I miss I her. Okay. <laughs> Thank Thanks you very everybody. much. Yeah, bye-bye. <laughs> Our uh, next video is uh, one that is focused on our Wounded Warriors uh, Canada veteran trainers to eradicate the use of child soldiers program. So please, uh, we would like you to see this next video, uh, which demonstrates some of the key aspects that uh, General Vance was just relaying for us. And in the last couple of years, I've been following. I just happened to come upon the Delaire Initiative, and but I had not heard of VTEX, or I, I don't know how I missed it. I had never heard of it. And then uh, two days before it was going to be closing, uh, I saw it, and I applied, not thinking that they would take me because I've been out of the military for 20 years, but I was accepted, and. Uh, and I came, and the first day of orientation, General Dallaire and Shelley were speaking to us, and General Dallaire said, uh, uh, my hope is that we will ignite that uh, fire of passion in your gut. And right there he had me, right there he had me, and I said to myself, this is it, this is absolutely it. It's one of those seminal moments of your life. I guess intuitively I must have known that it was right for me when I applied, because I don't Wait, tend to waste my time on something I don't think that I'm appropriate for. It was just that magical connection. And then this this last month has just, you know, confirmed it over and over and over. And my passion is just to make a bit of a difference. Not the huge difference that General Dallaire is making, but just do my own little part. And if that can be going overseas to train trainers who can help their own people? Absolutely. If it's going to be here in Canada delivering uh, education sessions, uh, absolutely. Whatever whatever needs to be done. This is, this is I mean, I, I'm out to spread the, the word and educate. My, I'm currently living, well, not living because I live out of a suitcase, but in northern Saskatchewan. I work, I'm working at a fishing lodge all summer, which is completely different from anything else I've ever done. But it's wonderful. But northern Saskatchewan, nobody has ever heard of child soldiers. Nobody has ever heard of, of all of these issues we're talking about here. But right there, we have right near us reserves, reserves, reserves. The exact same thing is happening. And I would like to go back and see if I can do something about opening people's eyes. I've already done that with my, my circle of friends. Good afternoon. I am John Irving. Ten years goes by so quickly. 
It is truly impressive to be able to see what General Dallaire, Dr. Shelley Whitman, and their team have accomplished in just a decade. In 2009, General Dallaire contacted me regarding his idea to create the Child Soldiers Initiative, and it was to be located at our very own Dalhousie University. We immediately signed up, and since then, the initiative has grown from strength to strength with national and international recognition. They've contributed to the drafting of two UN Security Council resolutions on children in armed conflict, the Vancouver Principles, and the delivered programs in over 55 countries. But even more importantly, they have saved the lives of many children and made it easier for those in various armed forces and police forces to do their jobs with care, compassion, and knowledge. Shelley and General Dallaire, our deepest congratulations on the 10th anniversary of the Dallaire Initiative, which is now known as the Dallaire Institute for Children, Peace, and Security, as of April 2020. This new level of prominence at Dalhousie will further raise the profile for you for all the important work you're doing around the world. We know that you will continue to do great work and make a huge difference. Thank you for all that you have done. And finally, thank you for letting us help. So thank you everyone for being with us and uh, thank you for those well wishes. I wanted to uh, take the opportunity to explain to you a little bit about the VTEX program as we call it. The Wounded Warriors Canada Veteran Trainers to Eradicate the Use of Child Soldiers program delivered education and skills transition training for veterans by combining academic fully credited university classes with specialized training that was built on Canadian veteran skills, expertise, and experience. Since its inception in 2016, the VTEX program had been specifically designed to prepare Canadian veterans to become force multipliers of the Dallaire Institute's mission to progressively end the use and recruitment of children as soldiers. Over the course of its tenure, more than 50 Canadian veterans from military, police, and correction services have been trained. And as a result, many have been engaged in a variety of programs, research, volunteer, and consultant capacities. A special thank you here today goes to Major Retired Brent Bearsley. Brent has been not only a friend and comrade of General Dallaire's during his time in Rwanda during the genocide of 1994, but he has been central to the initial work of the Dallaire Institute and the work that we have been doing with the Wounded Warriors VTEX program. The first ever Brent Beardsley Award was awarded to a 2017 VTEX participant. The award was created in his honor because of that critical work at the inception of our organization and his instrumentality in the creation and delivery of the inaugural year of the VTEX program. In the video that we just watched, you had heard from our 2017 VTEX Brent Beardsley Award winner, Carol Cuthbert. And on today's panel, we will be joined by the 2018 VTEX Brent Beardsley Award winner, Alexa Van Persen. She will be joined by two other uh, 2018 VTEX grads that are currently employed at the Dallaire Institute. Bill Watkins, who's our Senior Advisor, Research and Learning, as well as Anthony DiCarlo, who is our current Director of Policy, Advocacy and Communications. Prior to engaging with these panelists, I would like to introduce a very special member of the Dallaire Institute team, Jennifer McNeil. Jen has been instrumental to the Dallaire Institute's training uh, programs and the continuation of our work. She has been a training manager and a child protection advisor for the Institute, instrumental in delivering the VTEX program, as well as training programs across the globe. Over the past six years, she has been with the organization. Jen is someone who brings a great deal of passion to everything that she does. And I see her as one of the hearts and souls of this organization. So Jen, please welcome uh, to the panel today. Thank you so much, Shelly. Nice to see you with all of your African baskets behind you. <laughs> <laughs> 
So Jen, maybe if you can uh, start out by telling us how did uh, the VTEX participants and the program itself contribute in your opinion to some of the advancement of the Dallaire Institute training programs? Sure. The VTEX program has had a considerable impact on our training programs. Uh, as you said, the VTEX brought with them a diverse background of experiences to enhance our programming overall. They were men and women from military, police, corrections, and they themselves have been deployed to various locations, including Haiti, Congo, Afghanistan, and of course, domestically here in Canada. So you can already uh, understand the, this huge resource that they are, that they could be to us. So some of our training, uh, well, let me talk about our training core competencies to begin. So our, our trainings are uh, have three core competencies. So they would, all of our trainings talk about these three core competencies, including understanding this issue of child soldiers, uh, embracing that this is a security sector concern and understanding the importance of collaboration and reporting. So our VTECs have further deepened how important these core competencies are and from their experiences provided insight about how they could better be relayed to our different training audiences. Um, we have a handbook for all of our trainings, as you know. Uh, this is key to our trainings as well. Our handbook is research-based, but our VTECs have provided this extra layer to the handbook. They've supported us in content, structure, and even some of the translation that we've had with that, which is important because it's not a regular translation when you're talking about uh, specific issues to the security sector. You have to have that deeper knowledge, which of course our VTEX do. Um, uh, another key part of our training is our scenarios. So our, the beginning of a training is usually more theoretical, it's in the classroom, but then of course we have this practical scenario based training. This allows our participants to uh, really act out these interactions that they may have with children and child soldiers. And our VTEX have been able to uh, further enhance uh, these scenarios. So for example, we could have um, a VTEC who may have been deployed somewhere like South Sudan. We would part partner them up with some of our South Sudanese colleagues and they would come up with a scenario that's relevant to the, the conflict as it exists now so that, the, that they would see exactly what kind of scenario they might be facing. And then we would take that scenario and we would have, let's say, our Rwanda partners who will be deployed to that context and act uh, those scenarios. So it just provides a better overall operational effectiveness. Um, it improves our training and the VTECs are key to that. Uh, I'd like to speak about two more. <laughs> my favorite is, one of my favorite training tools is our DHX media uh, video that we have. Um, so this is a great training tool where we have uh, what it would be like without our training, engaging or interacting in a specific, specific scenario. And then after you have our training, how you can act differently as a security sector actor. So we've had our VTEX uh, who are joining us in that whole process. They were able to offer feedback and engage with DHX studios, the, the people there, to ensure that that video was as realistic as it, it could possibly be. Um, and it is one of our, our tools that our participants across the globe always talk about and really refer back to as, uh, as having an impact on their learning. Mm -hmm. And finally, uh, our TOT training. So the VTEX have been able to uh, offer you know, different supports in, in enhancing our TOT training. They've been able to come as uh, co-facilitators, in fact, internationally. So for me, one of our important things is the uh, makeup of our facilitation team. So we, we would have uh, facilitators from, let's say, Uganda, from Sierra Leone, but then we could also bring a VTEC facilitator. So these would be people, again, with the various backgrounds, men and women, and so we could um, have the participants hear real life ex experiences from a variety of different backgrounds about uh, you know, context that in, in conflict contexts where they've been deployed to. 
and how they react. So this just deepens the learning of our participants worldwide. Um, so it really makes the VTECs have really made our training more robust. Um, it's been my pleasure to be working with them and I value the support they've provided uh, to the whole training program. So thank you very much. Thanks, Jen. Thank you for that answer on, you know, all of the ways that they've contributed to the work of the Dallaire Institute. And I know that um, something that we don't talk about, there's an awful, awful lot of friendships that have been made uh, through that program also. Thank you, Jen, for joining us on what was supposed to be your day off. <laughs> I'll now turn to the rest of our participants for this panel. And I'm going to start with some questions for Bill, Alexa, and Anthony, who are joining us. My first question is going to Bill. Uh, Bill, can you talk a little bit about what drew you to the VTEX program in the first place? Uh, certainly. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Shelley. And uh, like many of the others, uh, we just sort of I just sort of heard about it uh, in passing through Facebook, through some friends that were talking about this. Uh, and having done a little bit of research on it, uh, it looked like I would have an opportunity to take some of the skills and background that I developed after 30 plus years in the military and continue to apply those. Uh, so, and obviously having understood the background uh, with uh, of uh, General Dallaire, uh, I was deploying to Bosnia in the 90s, and then again uh, in the 2000s in Afghanistan, um, having seen some of these issues, it felt like a good fit. What kept me with you know, the VTEX and, and kept me going and with the Institute now was uh, a few things. One, it opened up my view to a lot of different things that I didn't understand before, and particularly the plight of children in those zones. And uh, General Vance uh, spoke to uh, a little bit about that. We have a tendency not to see children in those areas. And I'm as guilty as everybody else uh, who went through that. And then it's coming to the realization, not just the effect that that has on the children in the area, but the effect that it has on the soldiers, the effect that it has on the community, and the effect that it has on the mission. The thing that's really kept me with the Institute has been their willingness to explore new ways of getting this message across. Uh, like many other people in the military, a big fan of training, big fan of teaching, I've taught at universities and that, but the, the flexibility of the Institute in saying, we need to find a best way to get people to understand so they will change their behaviors. And this allows us to explore some of the things that General Vance was talking about. Um, we're not trying to say you cannot do this, but understanding the humanitarian side, understanding the military side, here's a way that you can conduct your missions, conduct your operations, and meet the operational requirements, and at the same time, prevent recruitment and use, not exacerbating. So it's not overstressing. So it was really that, you know, that openness of the Institute, because a lot of humanitarian organizations we've come across in the military have, with very good reason, kept an arm's length from the military, from the security sector. This allowed it to bring it together. So it, it's a very novel approach, and I really liked that. Thank you, Bill. Thanks so much for that. And my next question is going to Alexa. So Alexa, um, you're joining us all the way from uh, British Columbia, and I wanted to uh, ask you, what did you learn that you wished you had known earlier? Thank you, Shelley. Um, I think it's safe to say that uh, we can all scan back over our lifetime and find spots where we say, if only I knew that sooner, I could have prevented it. Um, but it's not just about what we didn't know, it's also about what we thought we knew. Um, so knowledge and academics aside with the VTEX program, and I, I guarantee you there was a lot of that. Um, and not to mention the correlations once I started making the linkages between issues of child soldiers and gangs and human trafficking and radicalization, but that's a conversation for a whole other forum. Mm -hmm. um, when I reflect back on the VTEX, there's a number of things that stand out for me. Um, I wish I knew them earlier, but there's two things that stand out in particular. 
Uh, I joined the military shortly after becoming an adult, if we're using the definition from the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, and then I stayed a number of years and transitioned over to another uniform when I joined the police with the RCMP. So I thought I had a good understanding of what teamwork, partnership and collaboration was, but it wasn't until the VTEC that I learned to truly appreciate and harness the tremendous potential of multidisciplinary collaboration. It was with VTEX that I learned my voice really mattered. Um, so it was with my, my cohort, uh, which was from very diverse backgrounds. Um, we had some really heavy hitters as far as academic uh, background and, and credentials, as well as uh, their, their history in, in the military and in the police forces. Uh, so a lot of knowledge there, a lot of experience. But in addition to that, the Dallaire Institute staff and coupled with the Dalhousie students. Without the students, I, I don't think I would have achieved as much learning as I, I truly did. Um, and I discovered that by using my voice in concert with others, uh, we could really build momentum together. So in effect, I learned to communicate with respect for, but was not limited by my own cultural and organizational restrictions. So I understood that rank PhD or not, whether you're an NGO, police officer, military or a student, all those things have values, but they're not the things what change the world. We all have a voice and it's how and when we choose to use it that matters. And yeah. the second thing that I wish I'd known earlier is that in order to pursue remarkable change, we have to collaborate with each other. We have to be willing to sit at the same table and have those difficult conversations. We need to listen carefully to each other, but stand firm when, when necessary. When we collaborate with one another, if we keep putting children first and at the top of the peace and security agenda, we're on the right track. So thank you, Dr. Whitman, General Dallaire, and everyone at Dallaire Institute for the work you do and for allowing me to be part of this. Thank you, Alexa. So great to have you. And uh, thank you for joining us today. I have my next question is for Anthony. So Anthony, um, you are now you know, serving with us as the Director of Policy Advocacy and Communications. And I would like you to talk about how has the impact of being a part of that VTEX program, how has it Im impacted what you're doing now? Well, Shelly, I, I think it's impacted me a lot. <laughs> uh, uh, as you know, Shelly, uh, yourself, General Dallaire, and other members of uh, the Dallaire Institute team at the time, uh, we first met uh, when I was uh, employed with the Office of the Minister of National Defense. And uh, I was working on the United Nations Peacekeeping Defense Ministerial File, where members of the Dallaire Institute team, and but mainly yourself, Shelley, and, and the general, were drafting the Vancouver principles, you know, getting other civil society organizations, uh, rallying them around them, having them contribute, you know, uh, getting member states, going to New York, to capitals around the world, to have them sign on. And um, I still fondly uh, remember uh, draft one of the Vancouver principles on an eight and a half by 11 times new Roman 12 point font. You know, I still, I still remember that uh, when you presented that to us. And so that's where it all began. And uh, after a successful United uh, Nations peacekeeping defense minister in 2017, where we launched the Vancouver principles to 54 founding endorsers. I don't know if you remember this, Shelley, uh, but I went up to you and the general in the hallways and I asked, uh, to be given a Dallaire Institute pin, this pin. Yeah. And, uh, and I was told that these pins were only given to those that completed the esteemed VTEX program. So I said, well, if I want a pin, I, I, I must register then. And, and I did. Uh, uh -huh. and, and over the years, I came to realize that this wasn't uh, necessarily the only way to receive uh, a pin. Um, you can actually receive a pin uh, if you're employed uh, with the organization. And so I did that too. Uh, <laughs> seriously though, Shelly, uh, all kidding aside, the VTEX program, um, I would say uh, really changed a lot in my life. I learned so much. Um, I, it allowed me to see my childhood upbringing in inner city Montreal East, uh, or my professional career as a, still an active Canadian Forces Army Reserve 
uh, member and a UN peacekeeper in Haiti uh, in a completely different light. It allowed me mm -hmm. to inculcate the Vancouver principles and understand the importance of prevention and the necessary work that is required on the prevention side uh, with respects to the recruitment and use of children as soldiers. Uh, so shortly after I completed the VTEX program in uh, July of 2018 with Alexa and, and Bill, I was actually asked by the Dallaire Institute, and that was Jen actually who called me up and, and asked if uh, myself, along with Bill, who I'd already done it a few times, uh, co-facilitate a pre-deployment training in Rwanda. Uh, and it has changed me ever since. That was actually coincidentally two years ago, almost to the day, Shelley. Hmm. And um, so with the history of the founder growing up in the east end of Montreal and his lived experience uh, in the Canadian Armed Forces and, and in Rwanda specifically, uh, while assisting in the implementation of the Vancouver principles tangibly on the ground uh, with some of the best UN peacekeepers in the world today in Rwanda, I knew that my life had changed for the rest of, and the rest is history. And so I wanted to thank you, Shelley, the general, and all those that contributed to the VTEX program over the years, to ensuring that we, there was a program that existed for those funders that supported it, that I was able to take it uh, and complete it for my life has changed very much since. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Bill. Thank you also to Alexa. And thank you, Jen, for being here today, for sharing your experiences also though, for contributing to the work that we are doing and continue to do. And I'm forever grateful that you all uh, took the chance on being uh, participants in the VTEX programs and, and just want to extend that warm uh, thanks to you for, for all of that uh, work that you continue to do. So for all of the VTEX who aren't here today, <clears throat> who have been a part of these programs, I also want to extend a warm uh, wishes to all of you and hope that you're celebrating with us as part of this 10 year anniversary. Thank you so much. So as we move to the uh, next portion of our uh, event today, I wanna welcome a very special friend of the Delaire Institute, a very special friend of um, mine personally uh, James Thuch Madier, who is uh, here to talk to us from uh, a youth perspective. So James, I am really welcoming, welcoming you here today. Hello, James. <laughs> hello, hello, Shelley. Hello, Hi, James. East Africa. <laughs> James is joining us all the way from uh, Nairobi at the moment. And I want to uh, quickly give an introduction, James, to, to who you are. Um, he is a dear friend of the Institute, as I've said, but James is the executive director and founder of the Rainmaker Enterprise. James is originally from Tong, uh, South Sudan, where he lived until the age of 15 before relocating at that time to Kakuma refugee camp in Northern Kenya during what was then the civil war in uh, Sudan. James came to the University of Toronto in 2014 through the World University Service of Canada's refugee sponsorship program. Uh, he has been highly involved in international cooperation and transformative social justice work notably with the UN uh, High Commissioner for uh, Refugees, uh, the United Nations Alliance of Civilization and the European Union. And he has been celebrated as a uh, burgeoning leader and advocate in high level dis uh, discussions on things such as trade and inclusive and sustainable growth. James is currently pursuing a Bachelor of Arts in Peace, Conflict and Justice Studies at the University of Toronto but we welcome him here today to our special anniversary event. So welcome, James. Thank you for making the time for us uh, this evening for you in Nairobi. Thank you so much, Shelley. I'm really, really delighted to be a part of the discussion today. I enjoyed the 
previous discussions that already took place. I was a ghost and I enjoyed every bit of it. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, James, I wanted to uh, maybe relay for everybody a little bit about how we first met and um, how you came to know about the work of what was then the Dallaire Initiative for, um, uh, for the work that we are doing. So would you mind maybe relaying from your perspective, your first memories of your um, interactions with what was then the Dallaire Initiative? Uh, well, I mean, we, we actually, it's, uh, we are celebrating this 10, 10 year, or this day we are celebrating it. Uh, and I'm celebrating it from the place that we first met, right? Um, it was in Nairobi where we, where we met. It so happened that we were introduced and there was an event that we were supposed to do together with the general and the minister of uh, defense at the time and yourself in Ottawa. And, you know, we were exchanging emails and at one point I mentioned, actually, um, I'm in Nairobi. You, I think you mentioned you are in Nairobi now. And I also <laughs> said, well, I'm actually in Nairobi. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it so happened that you were delivering a training to, uh, to trainers, uh, uh, mostly uh, tr trainers that were coming from the African, the, the UN mission to, to Somalia and a uh, majority of them were from Somalia at the time. And mm -hmm. uh, you invited me to the session and I yeah. showed up not knowing exactly <laughs> what I was actually coming for. Uh, but I left, I left that session as a friend to you, to Jennifer, to Musa, to mm -hmm. a lot of other people that are connected. And it just remind me uh, still now that the Delaire Initiative is actually a very warm, welcoming environment that embraces you the moment you step into the door. And once I always warn people, if you don't, if you want to actually like uh, get closer to Shelley and the general and the, the layer initiative, you know that there is no turning back. You are a part of it. For life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like a disease. Once you have it, you might not uh, get cured. So, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Yeah. So James, maybe um, tell everybody a little bit about this exciting work that you're doing with your Rainmaker Enterprise and what it's trying to achieve. Well, um, um, you know, I think there is a lot of parallel between my journey and the journey of the Delaire Initiative and the journey of uh, General Delaire himself as well. There are parallels there, you know, out of uh, the hashes of uh, doom uh, comes out this refined uh, res re uh, resolve to be a part of a solution that actually uh, address some of the things that you have seen or that you have had the opportunity to bear witness to. Uh, so there is a lot of parallel to that. I happen to be uh, to be born into the midst of uh, deadly war in Sudan uh, before it divided into the two countries, and I saw things that um, you know other children should not see. And, 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 and that uh, really uh, ignited the fire in me when I uh, got the opportunity, a rare opportunity to study in Canada and be a part of uh, really the immense opportunities that are in Canada and the immense gratitude and you know, um, uh, a sense of action and global citizenship that exists in Canada. Uh, I leverage that to be able to actually go back to the place where I left um, has nothing but somebody that should have been a killer or could have been killed uh, to address some of the challenges that still exist. So Rainmaker was born out of those early experiences to really restore dignity to young people, to women, to millions of people that are highly impacted by uh, insecurity emanating from uh, simple issues, conflicts over re limited resources or conflicts over water clean drinking water for, their, for themselves and for their animals and their livestock. And you know the more impact that climate change is also adding to all those challenges in conflict affected areas, uh, really making it hard for people to, uh, to, to, to meet their daily needs and uh, pitting people, pitting communities against each other over these limited resources. So we envision uh, a, a new path of leveraging technology, clean technology, 
to provide clean drinking water for uh, communities and their livestock, and also for uh, irrigation, for farming, so that they can have food on the table and empower people from the grassroots level, enable youth that are at high risk of being recruited into, into militia groups to fight wars that they do not understand and actually provide productive avenues for them to be able to actually be a part of rebuilding their, their own uh, countries and their own communities. And so this is what Rainmaker stand for. We have already installed a solar powered irrigation system in, 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 in South Sudan, in Tons right now, that is serving over 3000 people. Uh, the, the, the general and yourself, uh, Shirley, have been integral uh, uh, members that have been very supportive from day one to see this vision uh, really take off because it aligns perfectly with the work that the, the Larian Institute is doing. Um, yeah absolutely and so james um having grown up like experiencing the impacts of conflict on it on children and in communities and then thinking um you know about this incredible uh, enterprise that you're doing with with rainmaker uh i recall a story where you were talking about going back to uh the communities where you're putting in some of the solar powered irrigation and you were talking about how people in the community were um, quite taken with uh, the fact that you had come from that community, but we're now coming back to give back. And so thinking through our uh, new uh, institute being focused on children, peace and security, I'm just interested if you can leave us with some final words about you know, hope for that element. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, uh, one of the most important things that I really enjoy about the approach of uh, the Lair Institute right now and before the, the initiative is this pre preventive uh, approach, right? Um, before you even talk of justice and before you even talk of uh, uh, peace, can we talk of how we can prevent conflict to even uh, to, uh, talk about peace and, and, and justice? And, and I think that's really, really important because most uh, humanitarian interventions or international uh, policies are usually revolving around um, uh, reaction. They are very reactionary. And um, the, 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 the Delair Initiative is taking a different approach by stepping back and looking at how can we actually prevent before we even talk about um, you know, resolving the, the, the conflict that has happened. I think that really gets back to my early origin. Um, if like, if there's nothing more, and this is, there's nothing I can do now to take back my childhood that was stolen from me by war, there's nothing I can do. But there is something I can do for the next child. There's something I can do for the next child that is, that whose, whose future is a threat of being squandered by, by, by a conflict that they know nothing about. And I think this is what the world should be focusing on like really making sure that the future for the children is not squandered uh, because we have the ability that it takes to actually prevent that from happening. So this is what I can leave you with. And uh, it's what keep me uh, sticking around the Delair Initiative, the idea of preven uh, prevention as opposed to reaction to, reacting to, 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 the, to, to the occurrence of conflict in the first place. Thank you, James. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your magnificent work. And thank you for you know, all that you're doing for the people of South Sudan and for children around the world also. Um, my deep uh, love and care for all of the work that you're doing and a big virtual hug all the way from Halifax to Nairobi. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Shirley. It's uh, really wonderful to be a part of this and I can't wait for more to come. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Yeah. So next we would like to uh, introduce a um, video that comes from one of our uh, Dallaire uh, Initiative graduates. Uh, this individual, Colonel Jusu, um, is someone who has served in the Republic of Sierra Leone Armed Forces. Uh, for 26 years. He is currently the defense attache and military advisor to the permanent mission of Sierra Leone to the United Nations in New York.
He is a veteran of the Sierra Leonean Civil War and has had several appointments in the course of his career. Colonel Jisu served as a platoon and company commander during the Sierra Leone uh, Civil War. He also served as a military assistant to the Chief of Defense Staff. And uh, currently he um, was also uh, focused on uh, Chief Planning Officer in the RSLAP and Commanding Officer in, sorry, in his past. Colonel Jisu is a graduate of the Ghana Armed Forces Command and Staff College. Um, he is also someone who has attended to the Dallaire Institute's uh, work in terms of being one of the first trained trainers in the programs that we have done in Sierra Leone. I want to uh, take the moment to uh, now allow you to see a pre-recorded interview that took place with uh, Colonel Jusu, where we discussed the origins of our collaboration together and the importance that Sierra Leone military and police had in our ability to deliver impacts across the globe. So I now turn it to uh, the video. The preventing of trauma is also very important. Your health and well-being is equally important to us as is the child's because you are also important to this country and to its security and stability, and your own families are impacted by this. So this is important uh, knowledge, and uh, certainly we reinforce this by working at an advocacy level with the United Nations. In March 2014, we helped to write this uh, Security Council resolution by ensuring this paragraph was put into it uh, when we worked with Luxembourg. And it's, as you will see, it now talks about the fact that countries that are peacekeeping and uh, troop and police contributing countries undertake targeted and operational trainings for the preparation of UN mission personnel so that you can prevent violations against children. Recognize, report, report and respond to violations and abuses committed against children is also equally important that we have to have this data and information collected. Okay. Colonel Jusu, uh, we were just talking about your experience and having this training with the, what was then the Romeo Dallaire Child Soldiers Initiative in Sierra Leone. And then personally, your experiences in understanding what conflict was like, and in particular, the use of children in the war in Sierra Leone. So can you just talk about why this training was so important to you from a personal experience? Um, the training was uh, the training was very much important to me and many of my colleagues and compatriots back home because, as I said initially, in the course of the war, all parties to the conflict we are guilty of the recruitment and use of child soldiers, and they were used for a multiplicity of purposes. Yes, but after the war. And with the launch of the Romeo Dalia Child Soldier Initiative, the training and education we got from that really attuned us to the grave violations committed against these children. And it was very much important that we understand these grave violations and try to move beyond that. And let us recall that for West Africa, West Africa sits within a trouble zone where the issue of child soldiers had been very, very much rampant. So with such a training, and thankfully, we were able to have colleague officers from other West African armies who were equally trained in Sierra Leone. Mm -hmm. So the training was not only a, pi a pilot project for Sierra Leone. Coincidentally, we were able to provide such opportunities for our brothers and sisters in other West African countries who equally sit within, I mean, a region most notoriously known for the use of child soldiers. And thankfully, Sierra Leone has been able with this trained personnel to be deployed into missions where those problems exist and where the expertise they've gained from this training is now being used to address or prevent 
the current or future recruitment of the use of child soldiers from Somalia to South Sudan, to Sudan, to Mali, to Central African Republic, to Congo DR, yes, to Unifil in Lebanon, Sierra Leone has deployed a good number of its trained personnel. And this training has become not only a doctrinal and security issue, it is now part of our security policy. It's so wonderful how you talk about the changing of the mindsets dynamic because I can certainly recall some of the revelations from many of those who had partaken in the trainings that you were referencing and how critical it was to altering the way that people might have thought about children and the way children might have been used in child labor practices and comparing that to that, it was just another form of child labor during the war, right? It was just another way of children being employed, but realizing and I think I recall this coming from you directly, you know, that the really important thing for us to understand is that when we use children, we are destroying our future. Um, but I guess the one point that I wanted to ask you is um, when we first went to Sierra Leone, we had the hope that we were helping to help Sierra Leone with their journey uh, to consolidating uh, peace and security after the conflict. And I wonder now if you look back at uh, Sierra Leone now and into the future, if you're confident that the recruitment and use of children in Sierra Leone is something that is of the past and shall never again occur. We are very much confident about that. Sierra Leone has moved on. Sierra Leone has moved on in, with your collaborative support. We've been able to turn the curve on that. Yes, we thank, we thank God due to the resilience of the people of Sierra Leone, due, due to the collaboration with the Romeo Dalia Child Soldier Initiative. Sierra Leone has been able to move beyond that point insofar as we've realized that um, it, it, it's absolutely not good. It is absolutely a cause for future problem we've realized that children are the future leaders of our societies. We've realized that involving or recruiting children does not bring any military or tactical advantage in their use. Mm -hmm. we've, we've, yes, we've realized that education, education and education is a key import in turning that chapter. That is why we are very much grateful and thankful to the Romeo Delia Child Soldier Initiative for not only taking the initiative to Sierra Leone security sector institutions, but also to youth groups, academic institutions. And we're grateful for the partnership and the relationships with all of you who became our change makers, uh, change makers for the world. So that part is so important to how we conduct our work globally. And I know as you're finishing up your term as a defense attache for the mission in uh, New York, that we're gonna continue this fruitful relationship and continue to work together into the future. Thank you, Colonel. Thank you so much, Shelley, and thank you to the Dalia Institute for Peace, Children and Security. We look forward, Sierra Leone look forward to enhance cooperation and collaboration with the Institute. And let me at this stage thank the Dalia Institute for their global vision and for being transformed to an institute. We look forward to receiving the Institute in Sierra Leone and to continue working with you. I thank you most sincerely. Thank you. Take care, Colonel. Nice to see you. Thank you, everyone. I know the time has uh, been going on us and it's, it's, we're, we're over time, but I do hope that people will stay with us for the remaining uh, few uh, portions that we have because there's some really incredible pieces about to uh, be uh, displayed for all of you to see. And in particular, I'm so excited about this next uh, video that we want to show you and uh, the one subsequent because our work in South Sudan has been incredible. The Dallaire Institute has been conducting training of national security forces in South Sudan since 2018. 
And in 2019, as part of the peace process, national forces began a unification process, whereby security forces from the various parties to the conflict started the long and complicated process of joining into one newly amalgamated force. During February of 2020, Dallaire Institute training team began gathering in the bombed out remains of a brewery destroyed by the North during the South Sudanese War for Independence. The training team had varied backgrounds, a mixture of military and civilian experiences, including two Sierra Leoneans, two Canadians, and five South Sudanese who joined this mixed training team. The temperature at that time was expected to hit 42 degrees Celsius within South Sudan. As I am describing the context of this particular uh, experience, I want to also relay that it was exceptionally special to have Saidu Karbo, a major in the Sierra Leone Armed Forces and a Dallaire Institute graduate from our Training of Trainers program in Sierra Leone as part of this training team. The ability to connect our graduates from other national programs in Africa to be champions of change is powerful. I recall an occasion in Sierra Leone with Saidu after he had undertaken our training. We were at an Arslaf military base where families and soldiers reside together. Saidu could see that as I entered the compound, I was looking at the children who were running around the base. He turned to me to ask, so doc, what do you think of children and families being here on this compound with the military? I took a moment and I looked at him and then I asked the question, so now that you've taken our course over this past week, why don't you tell me what you think? As a result, this opportunity for all of us to engage and learn from each other and to find ways to meaningfully uh, do South-South collaboration and to continue the work of uh, our trained trainers becoming champions of change has been something that has been one of the proudest moments I know personally for me uh, to be associated with this organization. A country that was once embroiled in a major conflict that was characterized by the recruitment and use of children as soldiers, but now had come to understand the devastation this created for generations to come, has now been actively part of helping us to make concrete steps to prioritize the protection of children and the prevention of their recruitment and use. And I am forever grateful to the country of Sierra Leone and all of the members of our team. Key to this uh, unification training that we're about to show you is that there have been representatives from all of the warring parties that were signatories to the revitalized peace agreement present, yet, there was no obvious division between these groups in the seating arrangements. Seeing the ability to have these groups come together with the goal of preventing the recruitment and use of children as soldiers was a powerful testament to the children, peace and security agenda. The video we are about to play details one example of how the Dallaire Institute was part of this process and how we contributed to increase the knowledge of members of the national military and police on preventing the recruitment and use of children as soldiers, which is also the need to include a gender responsive approach in South Sudan. And we hope that by displaying this next video, you will see the very power of what I just tried to describe not so eloquently. <laughs> Thank you. Shokolada Talinda, the mean bit I had him, Captain, Captain Malish, Becky with Kalam Fo. Like in Hassa Serekida, and then at Kalam and Isako, Shokolada Talinda Mahabashnawa, Captain Malish Becky won his Mahabu Fo. Hassa and in the name of Kalam and Gawani, Al Gawani and Alemia, Wal Gawani and Mahalia and the Biahmi, Al Adfal with a picnic. Armed forces or armed group 
in any capacity, it can be boy or a girl. A Jenna and a skate. The Ayy Jenna and the Jenna in Majmuad al Musala. Our Jenna and the Ayy Majmuad in the Musala. Who are Jenna and the Yetter Vestal and Manazel, Majmuad al Musala, who are the Zamia with Berlin. Vestal and Mom, the Ayy Shaw. Mom, Vestal and Ubeshin Sila. So, this is the definition of a child soldier. that very powerful video. I want to relay that uh, when we began to plan for that particular training, we weren't sure how we'd be received by such a large and diverse group under the conditions that we experienced. We quickly observed though that participants were eager, eager to discuss both uh, the many aspects of child soldiering and concepts related to peace and security. And our approach to linking the prevention of the recruitment and use of children as soldiers to the success of building peace and security in South Sudan resonated with all of those who were present. This leads me to our next guest, who is Mama Sarah, as we refer to her. Mama Sarah is a longtime activist for women's and children's rights in South Sudan. She is the former chairperson of the South Sudan Women General Association and executive director to support uh, for women in governance organization, which is called SWIGO, a network of women leaders spanning the 10 states of South Sudan. In that role, she has worked to elevate women's issues in the building of a new state. During the year leading up to independence, she led the mobilization of women in the 10 Southern states to vote during the referendum and conducted civic and voter education. In the end, women made up 52% of the voters. In addition, Mama Sarah has worked with a coalition of women to advocate for women's rights in the drafting of the trans transitional constitution for South Sudan. In 2010, elections for the government of national unity of, of Sudan, she led civic education outreach efforts and served as an election observer. She was heavily involved in the liberation struggle, working with other women to restore communities after conflict and to provide education to children. She has also been a member of many civil society, um, civil society initiatives, including the women-led organizations task force on engagement of women in peace processes, South Sudan Women Peace Network, uh, South Sudan Women Forum, and the Coalition of Civil Society, as well as a women's monthly forum. The following video is a pre-recorded video of an interview I did with Mama Sarah. She joined me from Juba and from our offices in South Sudan, where we discuss the importance of our collaboration together and our impact across South Sudan. So please welcome the video. Thank 
you so much for joining us from Juba, from South Sudan today, for taking the time to be with us. Uh, for everyone to uh, understand, you've been working with uh, the Delaire Institute and you are the executive director of SWEGO. And we'll talk further about your, your particular organization and the work that you do uh, as, as we begin through the questions today. Uh, my first question to you is, uh, Mama Sarah, I understand that through your community work across South Sudan, you have encountered the issue of the recruitment and use of children as soldiers. And we're just wondering if you can help all of us to understand the issue further, um, talk about some of the examples of what you have seen, and in particular, some of the challenges that are different for boys and girls um, in South Sudan. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. It is a pleasure to be here today. Yes, I've been working for the community. I have encountered the issue of child recruitment since I was a teenager. This is, has been lifelong experience that has also been witnessed within my family cycle and among my neighbors and within the communities. Uh, it has taken various shapes from voluntary to forceful recruitment of children in the armed groups, boys as well as girls, encounter this issue in many interrelated ways. For the girl child, it is a death sentence for their dreams. They have taken into those armed groups as wives, irrespective of their age, cook and slavers, sl slavers and also used as spies. Mm -hmm. They are raped on their first encounter with the armed men or follow or fear of boys, children. And this is denied and any choice. Emerging as teenager mothers and with no choice but to continue to bear more children along the way, depending on the dynamic of the conflict. And the side they are conceived in the young girl are more permanent, cut off from enjoying the opportunity to grow up normally as other teenagers girls. They want to receive an education and will be left to permanently exploit and gravely abused by their abusers. The boys who, are, who have been recruited into armed group have nearly been made to believe it is the most patriotic things to do. And that is their involvement position, position them at the top of the society as powerful and brave warriors in defending of their motherland. The Ghan culture has therefore become a symbol of relevance to society and an aspiration for the young boys. In South Sudan boys level, their use of the gun to attain what they need, either through intimidation of their victim or through battle and violence means. The boys upon recruitment into armed group turn extremely violent, lose nearly all consideration for civility and rest to forceful existence. The trauma keeps building within them and make them life, make them, uh, them life violent, life throughout their childhood and adult life. 
Thank you. Thank you for those really important uh, pieces that you've relayed uh, in terms of what you have seen and the challenges that exist. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here today, even to talk about prevention of or recruitment of children in the armed group. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mama Sarah. Thank you to um, all of our amazing staff members in Juba. And I wanna also thank Kalina McCall who's been leading that work uh, for us as our um, country director. Huge uh, amount of gratitude for all of the work you've been accomplishing. Thank you for those who have supported us through these times as we've tried to articulate it from the beginning until now, we would not have been sustained without your support. And I'm thrilled to end today with a final send off of more of our fantastic supporters and collaborators. But before I do that, a huge thank you goes out to all of the Dallaire Institute staff members all around the globe, present and past for your commitment to our vision. I wanna thank in particular today, a few individuals who helped to make today incredibly powerful. Thank you to Paige Black, to Anthony DiCarlo, to Amara Bangura, to Lee Smith, and to Alyssa Walsh. To anybody else who contributed in any way to the videos, to connecting to others, to being present today, thank you immensely. Thank you also to Dalhousie University and to the supporters within this institution. I would like to thank in particular, President Sani, Lori Ward, Sheila Blair-Reed, Dr. Frank Harvey, Dr. Alice Aitken, Dr. Graham Gagnon, Chris LeBlanc, the Dalhousie legal team, most especially Karen McClay and John Hope, to Chris Hattie and to the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, to now the Faculty of Health and Law who are supporting this new institute. And we're looking forward to the creation of a new Canada Research Chair in international peace, security, and children that will be added to the complement of what the Dallaire Institute brings to Dalhousie University. Thank you also to the governments and the organizations that we work with globally, but in particular, thank you to Rwanda. Thank you to the government of Rwanda, the Ministry of Defense, and for our work to establish the first African Center of Excellence in Kigali. Thank you to Sierra Leone and to Somalia. Uh, we're so grateful for the opportunity to work with you in your country, to Jordan and to Uganda and to every other country that we've ever trained anyone from. Thank you for being a participant and a champion. And today has been very special. So I ask you to enjoy this final video. Please check out our website, spread the word. And if what you've heard today inspires you to support this work in any way, please visit our website to learn more about how you can support our work. And thank you on behalf of the generations to come. As we celebrate the 10 years of impact by the Dollar Institute, I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate the Institute, its founder, General Romeo Dallaire, the CEO and her entire team for the amazing accomplishments they have been able to achieve during the last 10 years. On behalf of the government of Rwanda, and on my own behalf and, and the entire team at the Rwanda High Commission in Canada, I would like to renew our full support to the Institute and to its Center of Excellence for Peace and Security based in Kigali, the Republic of, of Rwanda, and our commitment to the Vancouver uh, principles. A great 10th anniversary once more, and may God bless you all. Thank you. Congratulations to the Dallaire Institute for 10 years of invaluable work to protect children in armed conflict. 
Your contributions to this field are unique and strategic, whether it's providing training to the security sector, spearheading new international guidelines on peacekeeping, or conducting new research on the predictors of child soldier use. Human Rights Watch is proud to be your partner, and we look forward to continued collaboration in your important work. Queridos amigos y amigas del Romeo Daniela Child Soldier Institute, feliz cumpleaños. Felicitaciones for this great accomplishment transitioning from initiative to institute. And above all, congratulations for your commitment to peace and security and for the significant impact that you make every day by improving the lives of children in armed conflict. I know you have a great future ahead. I'm happy that Uruguay is working closely with you and I hope that we will reinforce this great partnership in the years ahead. Gran abrazo, vamos arriba, allons-y. Tiens à féliciter la Fondation et le Général Romeo Daller pour leurs 10 ans d'activisme en faveur des droits des enfants dans les zones de conflit. En ce jour de célébration, ma joie est triple. Depuis 2016, il n'y a plus d'enfants soldats au sein des forces armées congolaises. De plus, le président de la République démocratique du Congo, M. Félix Antoine Tshiseke de Chilombo, a mis en place le programme de désarmement, démobilisation, réinsertion communautaire, appelé communément DDRC. C'est une nouvelle approche conçue par le chef de l'État en vue de l'éradication des groupes armés dans les zones de conflit en RDC. I wanted to wish congratulations uh, to the Dallaire Institute for Children, Peace and Security on an incredible 10 years of work um, advocating, impacting children in peace and security. What an incredible milestone to reach. And I look forward to incredible work coming from, from the Institute, um, helping to prevent the use, uh, the recruitment and the use of children in armed conflict. Um, this, is, this is an incredible, incredible moment to see the, the Dallaire um, initiative turning into a formal institute. Uh, so thank you to Dalhousie and thank you to the work of General Dallaire and Shelley and all the team. Uh, this is an incredible work and I look forward to doing more work with you guys. Congratulations. Well, a big congratulations to the uh, Dallaire initiative team. It is a big milestone, a decade uh, of work. We're so inspired by the work you do. Uh, we have had a long relationship and we knew right from the start that uh, we were dealing with a special team with a purpose much bigger than themselves. It's, as I said, really inspiring to watch you. We all want to be uh, better persons uh, when we deal with you and we know that the work you're doing is having an impact and it really matters. I've had the opportunity to be uh, with Shelley and the general on the ground in Rwanda a few years back at the uh, Peace Academy. And I was so impressed by the engagement uh, of the folks involved in this process. This certainly gives me confidence that uh, you will continue to have an impact for many years to come. On that, good luck, congratulations, and uh, we want to maintain that partnership and help you move mountains. Thank you. Thank you.